Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Ben Schoenberger, and in this lecture, I will summarize the steps necessary for vertebrates to live on land, including the evolution of support, locomotion, feeding and respiration, water balance, and finally, reproduction. All of these steps were necessary for vertebrates moving from a completely aquatic environment to living full-time on the land. When vertebrates were still developing their jaws and were mostly jawless, wormy fish, plants and insects were already exploiting the resources of the land, as well as fungus and bacteria, which had taken to the land early in the history of life. Thus, the Devonian period uh, saw lush forests, early seeds, and a diverse fauna of insects were already present on land. Thus, the vertebrates were latecomers to the party, and when they invaded the land, it was well populated with life. Vertebrates that live on land are often referred to as tetrapods, which simply means four-legged. Amphibians, as we will see in a later lecture, are an early branch off of the early tetrapod group that also includes lineages that evolved into early reptiles. Thus, the term tetrapoda is seen as a monophyletic group, whereas amphibia is considered a paraphyletic term. Modern amphibians are placed in a monophyletic group called the list amphibia, although often we refer to these early land vertebrates as amphibians in that they live both in and out of the water. Support. Life on land required a skeletal support system that most fish lack. Life in the water provides a buoyancy to animals such as fish. Thus, the major evolution in vertebrates to be able to survive on land required a stiff support structure, an endoskeleton. Thus, it was not surprising to see that it was within the bony fish the first land vertebrates arose out of. The ray fin actopterygian fish that include most living bony fish today lack the more robust bones and the fins to provide support, where, while the lobe fin sarcopterygian fish had thicker fin bones, which could provide a greater support to the animal as it transitioned out of the water. Thus, no actopterygian fish has made the transition fully onto land. The living mudskipper fish is the closest this group has come to being terrestrial. So the first terrestrial vertebrates originated within the sarcopterygian fish, the group that contains both lungfish and coelacanths. A strong support we see in these lobe fin fish of robust bones in both the pelvic and pectoral fins, allowing these animals to keep the body off the ground, although a number of modifications of these bones would be necessary to maintain both support and locomotion on land. This upright support would help in respiration and breathing, as well as movement across the landscape. Locomotion. The sarcoptrygian fish, Esthia optriodon, exhibits a unique set of bones in both the pectoral and pelvic fins, which are precursors to the bones in the arms and legs of terrestrial vertebrates. A single bone, the humerus, attaches to the pectoral girdle to form a shoulder joint. This single bone is followed by two parallel bones called the ulna and radius. This one bone and two distal bones is also repeated in the pelvis with a femur and tibia and fibula in early tetrapods. Additional bones help form the wrist and fingers and the heel and toes. One of the biggest changes was the origination of the humerus and ulna and radius articulation. In fish, these bones are straight projections from the body, while in land vertebrates, the humerus forms a right angle, an elbow. This means that these early terrestrial vertebrates were able to do 
push-ups for the first time, pushing their bodies above the ground and allowing them to take their first steps. In fish, the pectoral girdle is attached to the back of the head, articulating with the bones that cover the gills. Early terrestrial vertebrates had to decouple this attachment and associate the pectoral girdle with the axial skeleton. Thus, for the first time, terrestrial vertebrates evolved a neck. This freed the head to be able to move around independently from the forelimbs. Note that you can't walk around with your arms attached to your head very well. In the pelvic girdle, the bony supports had to become attached to the vertebral column from their loose attachments to the body wall on the ventral belly of a fish. This meant a formation of bone that formed the pelvis. So the steps for tetrapods to take their first steps are as follows. First, the humerus, ulna, and radius bones formed in the arm. The femur, tibia, and fibia bones formed in the leg. The wrist and hand bones, the ulnar, the radial, the intermedial, and the centrale, and finger bones, the carpals, uh, metacarpals, and phalanges uh, formed. And then fourth, the pectoral girdle separated from the skull, and the pelvic girdle attached to the vertebral column to form a sacrum. Once these steps were achieved, vertebrates could take their first steps on land. Feeding and respiration. The feeding strategies of early terrestrial tetrapods had to change as well. Suction plays an important feature in feeding in fish. While on land, early tetrapods had to learn to use their jaws to bite and snag prey. Most early tetrapods likely fed on insects along the riverbanks. They had a primitive jaw joint limited to a single articulation between the quadrate bone in the skull and the articular bone in the lower jaw. Breathing was also a new problem for these terrestrial tetrapods. They needed to pass oxygen into their lungs. Now many bony fish, including acoptrygians and sarcoptrygians, have primitive lungs. These likely developed as swim bladders that became modified to provide a secondary source of oxygen, especially if the water became anoxic. One problem, though, was how to fill these lungs on land. Early tetrapods developed two ways for filling and emptying their early lungs. The first was to use their ribs, which could use the segmented costal muscles that run between the ribs to expand and compress the chest cavity in breathing. We use the same way to fill our own lungs. Early tetrapods also use buncal pumping, where the air is sucked into the mouth and throat through the expansion of the mouth and throat cavities, a technique that's used by modern frogs. Sensory systems. Sensory systems also had to change in early tetrapods. First, unlike fish, early land vertebrates had to acquire a sense of hearing. How early land vertebrates did this was to take the hyomandibular bone. This is the bone of the jaw. Remember that in sharks is the cartilaginous bone that pushes forward the jaw. But in early tetrapods, the hyomandibular bone is shortened and placed in the back of the skull, still near the jaw joint, but it lay under a membrane in the back of the head. Now this membrane acted like a kind of a drum head, which when sound waves hit the membrane, the bone under the membrane moved. And this hyomandibular bone is now called the stapes. This was not the best way of hearing, and these early tetrapods had a tough time hearing sounds, particularly of prey like tiny insects. One way to improve the listening was to lower the jaw down against the ground and feel the vibrations through the lower jaw and across this membrane and bone. The sense of hearing developed over time, but many of these early tetrapods had poor hearing. Water balance. One of the biggest problems in early land vertebrates was the loss of water through evaporation uh, across the skin. Thus, 
Early tetrapods evolved a thick layer of skin called the stratum corneum, which is a layer of keratinized epidermal cells, which limits the amount of water loss. The early tetrapods also had to develop both a bladder and kidney system for the processing of liquid waste while minimizing loss of water and fluids of the body. Reproduction. We don't know much about early tetrapod reproduction. We assume that these early tetrapods living on the land had to return to the water both for fertilization of eggs as well as laying eggs in water, much like living amphibians do today. Thus, early tetrapods were not completely independent of a watery lifestyle. Some of the early tetrapods retain gills in adult forms, and there is evidence that they move between water and land throughout their lifespan of, a, of an individual. Now, tadpoles are found in fossils only going back to the Carboniferous period. Many of these early tetrapods likely did not have a major metamorphism like uh, frogs and salamanders do today. Rather, they likely had gills as larvae and lost the gills as they became more terrestrial. But the body plan did not change much with the young retaining four limbs. The metamorphism of modern amphibians is likely a derived trait that evolved later in the evolution of list amphibians. Although fossil evidence of the growth series of these early tetrapods would help give us a better picture of the ontogeny of early tetrapods to confirm this scenario. All right, you should be able to summarize the steps necessary for vertebrates to live on land, including the evolution of support, locomotion, feeding and respiration, water balance, and finally, reproduction. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Utah State University Geology Program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website, benjaminslashburger.org. Links are found in the description below.